If you don't know whether your individual customers, clients, guests are having a poor experience, then you're not really a customer-centric culture. Hey, everybody. Welcome to People Metrics Live. My name is Madeline, and I am the marketing manager here at People Metrics, and I am joined today by Sean and Kirk. So why don't you guys introduce yourselves to everybody? Thanks, Madeline. Sean McDade. I'm founder and CEO of People Metrics. Uh, been helping companies improve, measure and improve the employee and customer experience for, it'll almost be 20 years. It'll be 20 years in January, right, Madeline, the company? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Our birthday. Birthday, yes. And <laughs> before that, I, I did this for, I did the same thing for a number of years. So I've been overall working in this space for about 25 years. I have a book called Listen or Die, um, 40 Lessons to Turn Customer Feedback into Gold. And we're uh, excited to to be talking to um, the CX and, e, and EX audience on a bunch of different topics in the next few weeks. And hi, everybody. I'm Kirk Lobauer. I've been with People Metrics for about eight years, and much of that time has been either as an analyst on customer experience programs or as a project manager. So I've been kind of on the ground for a lot of these programs, making sure we're driving customer centrist. All right. Well, awesome. Um, so, so a little background on People Metrics Live. We just thought that it would be awesome. Uh, like Kirk and Sean said, we've been doing this for over 20 years, and uh, we thought that it would be awesome to start this weekly series where we answer all of your questions about CX and EX uh, live every single week. So um, I know today we're going to be talking, obviously, about CX, but next week we'll be answering, I'm sorry, next on Thursday, we'll be answering some questions about um, employee experience. And you can check out all the event listings that are coming up. There's, there's quite a bit of them uh, at www.peoplemetrics.com slash events. And uh, yeah, so all right, let's get started. So today's title of today's session is what does it really mean to be customer centric? So Sean and Kirk, what does it really mean to be customer centric? Yeah. This is this is such an interesting topic. I mean, I've been in this industry as 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 I said for twenty plus years now, and I've seen the terminology evolve um, from you know how do you satisfy customers, how do you engage customers, how do you get closer to customers, how do you become obsessed by customers, how do you become customer centric, customer focused. It's all these different words, but it's all it's all the same thing. It's how do we, as an organization, direct all of our attention and energy to delivering value to that customer and create an experience that is a positive one for that customer. And it sounds so easy to do, and it sounds like, yeah, why wouldn't everybody do that? But it's, it's surprisingly difficult. And, you know, as you see from the variety of experiences, probably the people who are on, the, on, on, on this uh, video with us, uh, I don't even know what we're calling this now. And are we calling this, this isn't really a, a webinar. It's more of a, it's, it's sort of a new category of thing, right? Yeah, like a, like a session discussion. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, we have to, we'll, we'll come up with the name, but it's, it's going <laughs> to, you, you're just kind of, e audience is eavesdropping on a conversation between the three of us. And we hope, we hope you get a lot of value out of it. Um, but Kirk, you've been working in this, you know, not quite as long as me, but you've, you've seen it evolve in the terminology and, and what clients have been calling it and been interested in. Um, you know, what, what's your initial take? Yeah, absolutely. And I think something you mentioned and, and, and we've talked a lot about before is, as you said, it's about delivering value to the customer, but value as the customer sees it. Of it, mm -hmm. It's easy as a company to have your blinders on as to what is it that we do and how do we deliver a positive customer experience but really that's up to the customer to decide if you're actually decide if you are delivering that value. So customer centricity is delivering value from their perspective. Without a doubt. Um, you know, and, and I think if you, it, it's sometimes helpful to ground the conversation in, you know, what are some companies that do a great job that everybody knows in being customer focused, customer centric, customer obsessed, customer close. One of our, one of our clients has a customer closeness initiative. So that's another word another term for this, which is great. It's all the same. It's, it's about getting close to the customer and, and, and really exceeding their expectations and delivering great experience. 
But just from my day to day, like I'm going to list some of my favorite companies in terms of the job they do in terms of delivering a great customer experience and being customer focused. So let me start with Peloton, which is definitely a modern tech a company in today's day and age, right? Um, you know, they certainly taken advantage of the new world we live in, but they are certainly really, really in touch with customers. They do a great job communicating almost on a, you know, it's not a daily basis, but it's every couple of days on what's coming up, what kind of achievements you've, you've hit over the last week. They do a great job connecting the community by allowing you to follow other people and then suggesting people to follow, suggesting classes to take that you might like. You know, it's, they've really made you feel like you're part of something special and everything they do with the experience really does that. Um, and that's sort of a new type of company that I think has done a great job with, with being customer centric. But there are some companies that really founded this industry, right? They high-end hotels, right? And great restaurants. Their whole product is the experience. And they're, of course, both hurting right now because of COVID. Um, but when you think of companies that, can, that have delivered incredible customer experiences and has, have been customer focused, you know, the names that immediately come to mind for me are Ritz, Four Seasons, Mandarin, and, 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 and places like that, where everything is, is, is surrounds the customer and nothing that the customer asks is too much for them. And of course, they're positioned as a high-end product and they certainly charge for it. So the expectation of the customer is very high there. But it doesn't mean that only high-end can deliver that great customer experience. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, in my day-to-day -day where something that's very important these days is grocery shopping and Trader Joe's is one of those for me where I think yeah. just the experience I have every time I go to Trader Joe's is fantastic and, and they've invested the time and effort to make that happen in a way that exactly you said it doesn't need to be a high-end luxury experience it just needs to be something that you clearly define you clearly invest the resources and energy into and then that is going to then be reflected in that day-to-day -day experience whether you are a Hilton or whether you're a Trader Joe's. Here's another modern, you know, 2020 great experience that I think a company that, that has the customer as its primary focus is Chick-fil-A, right? So my son who plays basketball, after every basketball game, he wants Chick-fil-A. And it isn't just because Chick-fil-A has a great product and they do. Um, it's just the process to get the product now through drive through is at a different level than anybody else, right? So most drive throughs now, you will drive and wait till you get to that little speaker thing that hardly, you can hardly be heard on, right? They may or may not get your order right. They, they're asking you all these questions because the menu these days is maybe faded out, but at Chick-fil-A, they actually have multiple people that are standing in that line, interacting with customers, one taking the order and the, or taking a pre-order, making sure you know what you're going to get, you get to the next one where you're ordering and they're swiping the credit card. And then you finally see a third one before you even get your food that's giving you your receipt. And then you get your food and it's always right. It's always in, in a nice neat little bag. And, it, and in my case, it gets devoured by my 14 year old son in the back seat. Um, but they're, they're, they're dealing with COVID, right? So they're making people feel safe and comfortable. Their process is all about the customer, making sure they're not confused, making sure they know what they want, making sure that there's no confusion to with the price or the receipt. And, and, they get, and you get the product in, in a timely manner, in an organized way that doesn't feel chaotic. And, you know, it doesn't have to be four seasons to have a, a, to be customer centric. You don't have to have that kind of price point. You can really have it at any price point, I would argue. Yeah, and that's exactly I mean, when we get to this idea of how do you define customer centricity, it's delivering value on those things that the customer values, where you, if you go to any of these fast food places, you're going to have food by the time you've concluded your this this visit. But if you come with the assumption that that's all that we're delivering, then you're not tuning into all these things that the customer will value. Uh, you need to understand that and deliver on all of those aspects if you're going to be successful, which is why. I have a great time every time I go to Trader Joe's because not only do I have groceries, but I have a great time doing it. So 
Listen, this is not controversial to say that the, the customer experience matters, that companies should focus on the customer, right? You can look at, you know, almost any mission or vision statement for any company in the Fortune 500, and it would be a surprise that if the word customer, client, patient, so whoever their customer is, whoever, whatever they call them, guest, would be part of that. So everybody wants to do this. But not everybody can, and not everybody does, certainly, in the eyes of the customer. So, you know, there's probably lots and lots of poor customer experiences that, Kirk, you've experienced, and Madeline, you've experienced, right, over time, right? And, you know, they're certainly the famous lists, and they seem to be dominated by telecommunications companies and airlines and banks. So, <laughs> you know... It seems like they have a they have general market on on customer dissatisfaction and poor customer experiences. Is that has that been your personal experience, Kirk and Madeline, yourself when you've when you've dealt with with companies in those sectors? I would say in my uh, personal networks, the the complaints I get in just a regular cocktail party setting about calling a uh, telecom communication company about your cable bill or something that's wrong with your internet um, is just generally a nightmare. <laughs> um, it, my my own experience included for sure. And what what makes it so, Madeline? Like what what makes it like something that where you would you would conclude that? What are some specific things that, that you experience that would result yeah. in that kind of conclusion? I'd say a common thing is probably a phone menu chain um, mm. where, I mean, how many times have, have we all uh, said, I just want to talk to a person. I just want to talk to a person. Let me talk to a rep representative, representative. <laughs> right. um, I think that it's something that probably, of course, has good intentions of uh, being efficient, but a lot of times ends up with frustrated customers on the other end of the line. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I think like from my perspective, a lot of that when it comes to industries that are defined by poor customer experience, it's often a failure to communicate expectations and then a failure to deliver on communicated expectations. The one that has recently been kind of the firmest in my mind is contractors. Uh, you know, I have my house and I was getting kind of work done on my house. And it's amazing just as, an, as a whole industry, everyone you, you call just will not call you back, will not come out when they say they will come out. And I found one that did. And so even in an industry that is defined by just across the board, poor customer experience. If you are able to differentiate slightly, that is the kind of thing that will kind of boost you up. Let me tell a story here. Um, so airlines is famous for poor, poor customer experience. Um, you know, they're, they're always one of the ones that, that, that show up on highly dissatisfied customer lists, rarely on, on the best customer, most satisfied customer list. Um, and for good reason, right? If, if you fly American U.S. airlines, it tends to be a very poor experience in general. Um, you know, they treat you like cattle. They're not very nice to you, the, the, the flight attendants for the most part. Um, there's not a lot of sympathy for problems. You know, the luggage space is ridiculously limited for the most part. So you always feel guilty bringing the bag. You know, there's all of these things. Um, and contrast that with, you know, I took a trip to Asia a couple years ago, um, and it's almost like it's a different industry, the Asian airlines versus the U.S. airlines. And I really think it's because they, they are mapping the journey of the customer, and they're making sure every touch point that that customer has is something that's pleasant. And they have processes, procedures that, that our U.S. airlines do not have. And it starts with just their lounges in general are at a level that's beyond anything we can even imagine here in the US. It's actually a good experience. The food is good. There isn't tons of lines. There is, they, 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 they've you know, made an effort to get customer feedback, I think, to understand what people would wanna eat, the workspaces people wanna work in, the number of people that is appropriate for a space so you're not on top of each other. They've definitely planned and mapped that journey in, in a way that the U.S. airlines either won't or can't. Like that, that's, that's maybe up for debate. But it just doesn't stop there. It's, you know, how, how just incredibly nice they are to every single passenger, whether you're in first business or 
in, in regular and coach in terms of helping you get to your seat, understand what's, what's available to you. They give you, you know, a menu in terms of what you, what you, what, what there is to eat. There's all sorts of communication throughout the flight in a nice way around what's our progress, how long it will be to land. And the condition of the planes are in much better shape than the ones that we are in. It, it is a completely different experience. It's the same commodity, which is a flight from A to B. But the way you feel landing after one of those flights versus, you know, on a typical American U.S. airline is, is like night and day. So the journey and the touch points are really important. I know, Kirk, you've done lots of work measuring touch points over the years for companies for our clients and, you know, making sure they're consistently good and they're measured is, is such a, such a big part of it, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And that, that gets to, uh, to, to the, what I was saying about the experience of the contractors and, but it really that goes across every industry is consistency is how you deliver a positive customer experience where if at any point you're tripping along the way as a customer, that's a negative experience that then colors every other part of it. Uh, where if you, you need to be confident that, you know, X action will happen at, at, at Y time. Uh, and which is the reason, especially as a customer or as a business where you have multiple modes of how you can interact with the customer. Uh, in my case, for many of my clients, it was for banks where, uh, you have a teller interaction, you've got an online mobile interaction, you've got an ATM interaction. Uh, and kind of for, for one example I have for one of my banking clients, they had an experience where uh, their ATMs would go through just a regular truing up. This is just a mechanical process, but the ATMs were down for this period. And it happened to be that across their network, all the ATMs went down at the same point every day for this kind of truing up process. So as a customer, you would go to an ATM, try to get out money, the ATM was down. So you go down to a road to the next location and that ATM was also down because just the whole network was down for the same time every day, which really, when it comes to customer centricity, you know, you, you think internally this process makes sense. If we have a network we need to maintain. We're going to have a single time where everything is trued up. As a customer, however, when you shift that lens, it just becomes abysmal. Uh, and so that's one of those trips in the process where you're able to measure and see Oh, our, our score, in this case, it was at, uh, an NPS where our scores are up everywhere except for this one, which for any company, it tends to be something very specific, very process driven of a simple change that if you view it from the customer's lens, that's, it has a big impact. Without a doubt. And, you know, when, when I see all of these different statements of customer centricity and vis mission and vision statements, one of the things I point out in my book is, Unless you make it real for the, for, for the employees who are delivering that experience, then it's, it's corporate platitudes, right? It's just something that people hear. It goes in one ear and out the other. And you know, one of the things we often talk about, Kirk and Madeline, is you know, the way to really make customer centricity real within a company is to measure the customer experience consistently and put that, that feedback, that, those results in the hands of people who interact with the customer every day so they can use that to improve the customer experience. And Kirk, you lived with this. I mean, this was your world for many, many years. Um, yeah, exactly. And that's, that's the thing. If, if, given that customer centricity is all about understanding their perspective and tailoring it to that perspective, you have to know what their perspective is, especially when the issues are so often going to be, why are the ATMs down every day at three o'clock? Mm -hmm. There's no way for you to know that unless you are hearing that perspective. Uh, and so if, if you kind of design your, your process in a silo, you're never going to be able to hear that feedback or even understand that's a problem until you just find customers not using this uh, or, and customers ultimately leaving. Right. There's no customer centric culture without a measurement program in place that's consistently listening to the customer and what their experiences are. It's then you don't have a customer centric culture. You have something else, but it's not focusing on the customer and it's not continually improving based on that customer feedback. I don't, if that's the number one way to become customer centric and have a customer centric culture is not just listen to customers, but to get it into the hands of the people who can make a difference. Mm -hmm. So, right, Kirk. So we, we 
I mean, we're generating, as we speak, we're probably generating how many alerts, and we can explain what those are, but how many alerts are being sent out right now to our clients based on a customer experience that may not have met expectations? So there's got to be. Hundreds, hundreds right? Thousands, yeah. So, but, but talk about the importance of that. You know, we're not just talking about sending out a survey to, some, to a group of customers every so often, you know, having somebody present it back to the client then thinking about it and maybe making a change every once in a while, although that's important. We're talking about more than that. We're talking about a daily improvement, a daily follow-up, and really generating ROI out of customer feedback, right? Like it's, that's, that's what customer-centric culture should result in. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And so when it comes to kind of this idea of, I understand what customer centricity is. How do I actually deliver on that? How do I make my whole company you know, get that mindset, mindset shift and get us to deliver on it? It is measured consistently. If you want to know customer centricity, you have to ask. And it's not just, it's not going to be the same thing in perpetuity. You need to ask regularly. And not only do you need to ask, you need to give it to the people who are actually able to do something about it. So if I, as someone who's you know, working at a branch or working at a grocery store or working at any of these places where I have the customer interaction, if the feedback doesn't make its way down to me, then the changes never make their way down to me. Yeah, let's put it this way. If, if for, the, for the people in the audience who are listening or, or watching this later on, on YouTube, if you don't know what that whether your individual customers, clients, guests are having a poor experience, then you're, you're not really a customer-centric culture. It's, you got to get down to the individual level. And I believe, Madeline, we'll do one of these just on this, on the whole notion of alerts. And, yep, yep. And getting, getting down to that individual level. But it's extremely powerful to know, you know, if Madeline went to a hotel, had a poor experience after she left, or even do, while she's there, she indicates via feedback that it's poor. The general manager of that hotel gets that feedback and is able to then contact Madeline in some way to make it right. That's extremely powerful. What does that do? It likely retains Madeline as a customer, so you reduce churn. It, it, it makes it more likely that you're gonna, you, you will return and maybe even return more often or buy additional services from maybe go to the spa if it's a hotel and you know, we're, we're not in COVID right now. We're just imagining the day when that doesn't happen, when we're back. And you, you will probably recommend that this, this hotel or, or whatever company it is to others. And conversely, if the experience wasn't handled, you might never go back and you may share if the company's lucky with just your friends about your experience, or you could go online to Facebook or LinkedIn or Yelp or wherever, whoever else and share it with the world. It's an extreme, you know, you have to button that stuff up for sure. Um, yeah, absolutely. And this is something where in my role as an analyst, we used, to, I used to do this quite a bit and it's very easy to, to show where if you, if you are serving your customers and a customer tells you, I'm dissatisfied or I have a low MPS, whatever it is, I had a problem. Uh, we've done analysis over a number of these clients to show that they have lower spend, either, either on that individual visit or just as a customer, they have, have less with your, their account and they are more likely to leave the company. Uh, and, and so when you have a customer who says, I'm, I'm currently unsatisfied, that isn't just something that you should use holistically to say, all right, what's the process? What do we need to change? That's very important. But for that individual, that's something that needs to be corrected because if it's not, they've lost that sense of consistency. They've lost that trust in your company and they're a lot less likely to return. And think of that network effect. I know earlier I talked about cocktail party conversations about mm. bad internet calls, but you know, just saving that one customer um, can either have them gushing to their friends that they had a great recovery experience with your company or um, angrily <laughs> uh, talking about a negative experience that they had. And there goes their, their little network that can bubble out from there. You know, you know Madeline, there's data that shows that when a cu customer has a problem and a company follows up and makes it right, they become more loyal than if they didn't have the problem at all. 
Right. And, you know, I've, I've joked with some of our clients, what you need to do is just have a bunch of problems, but make sure you have a really good resolution process. <laughs> and we all, la we don't really want that. I am joking, but it's true that you do have a great opportunity to, to resolve problems because customers are used to them not being resolved. That's sort of the reality. Um, hey, Kirk, I know we've, we're about, I don't know, we can go as long as we want, but we don't want to go too long. Why don't we, um, why don't we give some tangible examples of, of some things you've seen over the years that are, that, that are examples of, of clients of ours that, um, have been, dis have displayed a great customer centric culture. What are some of the examples of that, that they've, that, that you've seen over the years that you can say and point to is like, yeah, that's an example of someone really walking the talk with regards to being a customer centric culture or company. Yeah, uh, and that's I, I think ultimately kind of we're to be customer centric. You need to kind of understand what they value and put that in front of the employees' hands. We've emphasized a lot so far on if there's a problem or if there's a bad experience, how do you get that in front of employees' hands? But a lot of that goes for the positive feedback too. And some of the best clients I've dealt with, I, I worked with a, a telco company where uh, anytime a customer indicated that they had a great experience. That's something that they would pass along to that individual employee. They would call that out kind of, and, and put those scores kind of on the wall of you would walk by and see individual customer feedback, recognizing these specific employees. And you would also see, uh, they kind of kept a tally of how many employees were recognized and they had one of those kind of wooden plaques with the like, individual gold lettering where they put your name in and every month they would update with, here's if you got the most recognition awards. That's really important because another thing about being customer centric, you don't want to see yourself as in, con uh, in, uh, in contrast with the customers. It's not, we got negative customer feedback all the time. Here are people who are doing a great job every day and you want to make sure they understand the customer recognize that. Here's what they value and thank you for that great work you're doing every day. Uh, so you being customer centric, you want to put that in front of the employees who are delivering that experience. Yeah, so I think we should wrap it up, Madeline. Um, why, don't, why don't I summarize what I think is really, really important here around customer centricity. First of all, customer centricity is a goal every company should have. It's one that will result in very positive ROI for you in terms of reduced churn, increased spend, um, and better word of mouth. Um, it's a lot harder than it looks, though, and it requires the entire organization to understand and be focused on the customer. The best way that we've seen that to, for companies to do that is consistently listen to the customer after every key touch point within the customer experience. Kirk talked about a couple touch points in a banking contest text. It could be, you know, visiting a branch, using an ATM, going online to do some sort of digital transaction, calling a contact center. Those are four very common touch points. Measuring that consistently and over time will yield a really strong ROI, both from saving individual customers who have a poor experience by following up with them, and then also identifying like key areas, like you mentioned with that ATM downtime, that is happening all the time, and you can, you can, fo you can focus on that and fix it so nobody has that problem. You get, the, you get that information in the hands of the, of, of the frontline people within your organization who deal with customers, not just marketing, not just the executives, and then you start becoming a customer-centric culture that truly is somebody who's obsessed with cu the customer experience. That this is a process. This is not an event. This is not something you do once. This is something you do. And you follow up on and you iterate and you get better over time. The great companies who are constantly at the top of these lists, like USAA, like Amazon, like Trader Joe's, like Four Seasons, they are doing, they are listening all the time and making improvements for your customer experience. This is the foundation of everything we do, which is why it was our first one. And we look forward to diving into like some more granular topics coming, coming soon, but we hope that this was, this was informative and enjoyable. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Sean. Um, and, and I do have one question here um, yeah. in the Q&A. So one of these questions is, is um, that I'm doing a lot of listening right now at different areas and disparate um, systems. Yeah. How, how do I centralize that information um, when I have lots of listening posts out? 
Yeah, I think the, the number, and, and Kirk, you can jump in here, but I think the number one key to that is having, even if you're collecting the feedback through different kind of systems or, or programs, to have somewhere where the data comes in centralized so it's, it's all in one place and the right people are taking action on that feedback. It's, it's okay to have, like we just described four different touch points in that example. It's okay to have those four different touch points being measured at different times and maybe even going to different people. But you need to have someone within the organization needs to own that program, that customer experience or voice of the customer program and making sure the right people are taking the action which I think is the key to the success of it. What do you, what do you think, Kurt? Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. The success of any feedback program, uh, generally you want it centralized somewhere, exactly as Sean said. You want buy-in from leadership because it does have yeah. to be a company-wide mindset. And so that's why it's important to centralize and be able to communicate this to leadership and then throughout the organization. Uh, and I think the only thing that I'd add to that is it helps to have targets of, you know, we know this has ROI, so we need to know kind of what's our score today and where do we want to go? And that makes it very easy to say, you know, there's a benefit to this. Within our leadership team, we're setting this target. Uh, I'm kind of the, the owner of this if I'm the customer experience team. And I have something that I can communicate to leadership and I can also communicate this down to every person who owns this group. Of Here's the kind of target that we're looking for. Uh, and then work on that process of kind of regardless of how you're collecting feedback, uh, here's the score, let's listen to the feedback and, and let's kind of make sure each team is monitoring and moving towards their goal. And then I'll, I'll add one more thing to this before we wrap it up. Sure. If, there, if there's a lot of different like listening posts going on within an organization, one, one thing that the leader of customer experience or voice of customer, whatever you want to call it, can do is make sure that the the measure of the customer experience is consistent no matter what. So if that's net promoter score, make sure it's net promoter score across all of your listening posts. If that's customer effort, make sure that that's, that's, that's what you're, you're measuring or customer satisfaction or whatever it is. Make sure that that's, there's gotta be consistency. Otherwise, it won't come together in something that you can compare effectiveness of different touch points. You can't evaluate benchmarks, either internal or external, as Kirk was saying. Um, and maybe we'll do a people metrics live just on questions like that in terms of what are the best questions to ask and, and how do you handle that part of it. But I think that's, that's critical. Yeah, definitely. And and thank you both for such an awesome um, just discussion of customer centricity. It's obviously um, harder to define and even even sometimes more difficult to uh, actually put into practice as as a company. So it was great to get that definition of what customer centricity is. And I especially like what you both were saying about the importance of continuity and consistency in measuring. So, you know, for yeah. example, if you make a change, but you only measure once a year or ask customers what they think once a year, you might not be able to see how that change um, has improved or um, made, hopefully not, but made, made a uh, customer experience worse. We hope that doesn't happen. Um, but thank you both again. And, and thank you all for joining us uh, for People Metrics Live today. If you have any colleagues or friends who couldn't make it to this session, there's no worries about that. We're going to be posting recordings of all of these People Metrics Live sessions on our YouTube channel. So be sure to check that out. And you can also, of course, follow us on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And I also encourage you all to check out our CX blog. That's at www.peoplemetrics.com slash blog, where we're posting CX content all the time. And like I said earlier, we have a lot of great sessions of People Metrics Live coming up in the next few weeks. I know uh, we'll be answering, like I said, some employee experience questions on Thursday, uh, two days from now. So you can check out all the other topics we're going to be discussing by just going to www.peoplemetrics.com slash events. And as always, we love hearing from all of you. So please keep sending us all of your CX and EX questions. That's at uh, peoplemetrics.com slash contact. And we'll look to answer those in some upcoming sessions of People Metrics Live. So thank you all for joining us. And thanks, Sean and Kirk, for an awesome conversation. And hope you all have a great day. <laughs>